want to let you know that uh, you can feel free after we get started here to worship as you see fit, whether that's to stay standing, sit, kneel, uh, worship the Lord, enter in this time with, between you and him. Um, and that's what it's all about. All right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time where we can gather together in your name, unified as a body, Lord, around your truth and who you are. I pray that this would be a time where as we worship in song, that it would guide us into a place where the cares of life and the distractions would melt away, all the things that would normally just take our attention and even weigh us down would fall away, and that we would be able to focus on you, hear from your word, fellowship, and encourage one another. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good is it to gain the whole world, but lose your soul? What good is it to make a sweet sound, but remain proud? In view of God's mercy, I offer my all. Take my life. So take my life. So this next song, I want to just, um, I'm going to read a quick scripture. Um, this song is a bit like a classic liturgy where it's this poetic way of learning truth and sharing and, and sharing in that truth together. Back in the early days of the church when the written word wasn't nearly as available, uh, much of what was taught and shared was about the spoken word and often in song so that we would remember it. You ever find that, you know, songs stick in your, be in your head better than just words, right? And so... Many times in the early church, the way they would share truth and tradition and scripture was in song, in, in something called liturgy. And this next song is meant to be a lot like that, where there's that responsive nature to it as a congregation together. And so this uh, next song is also based on the scripture that Mara's going to share with you. 
from Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made?
be unto your name. Be unto your name. We are Lord. We are
shall forevermore endure the saints and days song. Amen. God, we do thank you for your incredible love. It's our prayer that that love would not end with us, but flow through us to each other and to our communities, to this world, that they would see who you really are through our love, first and foremost for one another, but also for them, Lord, that you would represent you well in that way, that we would walk in unity, in, in, in love and in truth.
God, we look forward to that glorious day with great expectation. May we walk worthy until then. May we be found faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, why don't you guys take a moment and greet one another. Good morning, church. And if you are new or visiting with us today, welcome. We're glad you're here with us. My name is Michelle Rodman, and I'm here to welcome you and give you announcements for the morning. Um, First off, this evening we have our fireside chat. That is where um, Pastor Adam will go into today's message a little further and give you time to chat about it with him. It's a little more interactive type of service, so you're welcome to come join us this evening here at 6.30 p.m., Um, Our first community barbecue will be this Wednesday here at the church. It will be at 6.30 p.m. We will be providing the mains. We're going to do barbecue hamburgers. If you can bring a side, a salad, or dessert to share, and feel free to invite your friends and neighbors. Um, It should be a great time of fellowship together. Hope you can join us for that. Um, VBS is coming soon. That's Vacation Bible School for the Little Ones. Um, Registration is open now. The dates are June 19th through the 23rd. So grab your packets and plan on that. Hope you can join us for that. Always a great time for the little ones. Secret Sisters program is launching today. So if you have filled out your form, please see Lisa in the foyer after service to get your assigned sister. That should be a blast. Men, please save the date. Our next Band of Brothers get-together opportunity will be this coming Friday, June 16th at 7 a.m. So um, hopefully some of you men can join up and have some coffee and chat um, and fellowship with the guys this Friday. Everyone is invited. That same Friday evening, this coming Friday at 6.30 p.m., we are going to have a church movie night. We will be showing um, the Jesus Revolution. Everybody is welcome to come. We will have hot dogs and snacks, so um, hopefully some of you can join us for that. It's a great movie. Um, Also, for the ladies, this coming Saturday, the 17th, Ruthie and a few of the ladies from Women's Ministry are going to be getting together for a women's thrift store extravaganza. Uh, They will be meeting here at 10 a.m. in the parking lot to kind of carpool around to hit the local thrift store as well as a couple down the mountain. So that should be a great time of fellowship. Let's see. um, Coming up very soon is going to be our Harvest Crusade. We will be going as a church to that on July 1st, Saturday, July 1st. I do have a sign-up sheet that will be in the foyer if you'd like to join us to travel down together and see the Harvest Crusade, please sign this so we know how many to expect are coming. Also, please be in prayer for that event. We do have calendars in the foyer that have a specific topic to be praying about for that event for the month of June. For example, today is pray for the musicians. Pray that the guest artists would glorify God in their lyrics and music. So I love that every single day they are in prayer about this event so that it can be a fruitful event. So with that, that's all of our announcements. I will pray, and then we will get into God's word together. Good morning, Heavenly Father. Thank you that we can meet you here today. Thank you for worship to get our hearts right with realizing just who you are. You are great and mighty and awesome, and we love you. 
Father God, I pray you meet each one of us today in a special way. Open up our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us in your word. And Lord, I pray for um, my husband Adam, Lord, that you would fill him with your spirit, that he might rightly divide your word of truth for us this morning. And it's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm not going back a third time. (laughs) After service, a stranger approached the pastor and said, I'd like you to pray for my hearing. The pastor placed his hands on the man's ears and said passionate, earnest prayer. How's your hearing? The pastor asked. The man, looking surprised, said, well, it's not until tomorrow. (laughs) Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I'd like to read from you, read to you, a little... uh, a paragraph or two from a Barna study that was done about prayer. Prayer is not only the most common faith practice among American adults, 79%. It's also one of the most complex and multifaceted. The Bible speaks of numerous kinds of prayers, supplications, incessory, intercessory, faith, and uses diverse language to describe the practice. Different traditions and denominations tend to emphasize certain kinds of prayers over others or even develop and build upon those laid out in Scripture. Perhaps the only consistent thing about people's prayer is that they're all different. Americans do not think about approaching prayer in any kind of a homogeneous way or even pray to the same deity if they pray to a higher power at all. A new study from Barna reveals the diverse prayer habits of American adults. How do you most often pray? The forces of our individualistic culture have influenced what was once a more communal, a more corporate conception of uh, Christian identity to one now focused primarily on the individual. The personal faith focus plays out most explicitly in the practice of prayer. Almost all American adults, 94%, who have prayed at least once in the last three months, most often choose to pray by themselves. Not only are most prayers a solo practice, but the vast majority are also most often silent. 82% compared to 13 audible. So affirming this shift is the fact that only a very small percentage most often pray audibly with one another or with a group, 2%, or collectively with a church, again, 2%. And this is something that I hope to change the culture here at CCRS because we should be praying for each other. Before each of the services at 8.30 and 10.30 in the back room, we go ahead and pray corporately. And I encourage each and every one of you to come on down and join us for that. So you may be asking yourself, why the Lord's Prayer and all this talk about prayer, Adam? Because as we begin chapter 11, that's exactly what we're going to look at. First, the Lord's Prayer. The disciples asked Jesus, Lord, Teach us to pray. 
Now, I have to level with you. I was a little bit overzealous when I first started making this message and originally planned to go all the way up until verse 32 where they were asking Jesus to show them a sign. However, after just the first verse, I wrote about four pages so I'm not going to keep you here until midnight tonight so that we could just make it to verse 32. However, we are going to delve deep into the Lord's Prayer. We are going to deconstruct. We are going to examine, to study, to inspect, to investigate this passage. We are going to go over this with a fine-tooth comb and see what the Lord has for us today. Are you ready to jump in? Are you ready to jump in? Yes! The title of today's message, Teach Us to Pray. Would you pray with me? Your precious Heavenly Father, Lord, even at the top of the heading of this scripture, it says a model prayer. And God, I pray that you would allow us to glean, to truly take some nuggets from this prayer and be able to apply it to our own lives. Lord, in order to take that which Jesus taught his disciples and teach it to us, let us know the power and the importance of prayer. Let us do it individually and let us do it corporately. God, I pray that you would be with us today. And Lord, as we delve into your scripture, I pray you would etch it upon our hearts. But Lord, if there's anything of man, let it fall upon deaf ears. You know how much we love you, we thank you, we sing your praises, and everybody said, amen. amen, amen. So first off, if there's anybody here who needs a Bible, raise your hand, and one of the ushers will come around and give you one. We will be starting in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of the disciples said to him, Lord Teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So as we begin, what is it that Jesus is doing? Is he fixing a meal for himself? He wasn't going hungry. Doing his wash? He always had the nicest robes. What do we see Jesus doing? Praying. Praying. Yes. And as far as we know, the disciples never said, Lord, teach us to preach. Or teach us to do miracles. I believe this is because hanging out with the Lord, they understood that his teaching, his witness, his miraculous power, that indeed all he was and all he did was linked to and a result of his devoted prayer life. Notice that the disciples didn't say, teach us how to pray, but rather simply teach us to pray. Every one of us who is a believer knows that the posture of prayer is the place of power. So why don't we pray? I believe one reason is because we've complicated prayer. We have made it something that it was never intended to be. Because we believe the lie of the enemy that prayer is difficult. It's time consuming. It's heavy. Do you realize we're only into chapter 11 here in the book of Luke, and yet we see Jesus praying again and again and again. And if we looked at all of the Gospels, we would see that those that were just recorded, he prays over 38 times. So again, why do we neglect our prayer lives? But Adam, I've got to go to work and provide for my family. Yes, and you could have prayed while you were driving to work, shut off the radio, stop listening to the music, stop listening to the news, and just talked with him. But Adam, I've got to feed the kids and get them off to school. And as you got them onto the bus, couldn't you have just said, Lord, please watch over them and let them return safely at the end of the day? You see, prayer doesn't have to be this long, arduous, consuming thing. Think about Peter when he walked on water. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. And in verse 28, it states, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And Peter had come down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out saying, Lord, save me. 
And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. What was Peter's prayer? What was his request, his plea? Did he say, Oh, great, powerful, and heavenly Father, maker of heaven and earth, the Alpha and the Omega. No. Just simply three words. Jesus, save me. Our prayers can be just like that. Yes, there is a time and a place where we find our prayer closet. We set aside that special time to spend with the Lord. But he really just wants to hear from you. Now, let's say that you were to take a trip to South Dakota. You were going to go see Mount Rushmore. And you get into the car, you look over at your wife, and you say, here we go. And you drive. Then as you pull into the campgrounds, you look at your wife and say, we're here. But you didn't say a single word any time throughout the drive. Now, your partner might be thinking, what's wrong with them, right? And it wouldn't have been too much of a trip, would it? But yet we can wake up in the morning, pray before our meal, come home from a day's work, say our prayers before going to bed, and yet we think that this is having a good prayer life? A way that we stay closer to God? You see, Thessalonians doesn't say, pray without ceasing because it's a nice suggestion, And it's not just a command, but a way that we create. We foster that deeper, more intimate relationship with our Lord. God commands it. Jesus models it. Now, when are we going to start following it? First, we see the disciples' respect for Jesus as they wait for him to finish. Then, we see their humility as they come before him. And they're like, we don't know everything. We don't pray like Jesus does. Lord, teach us how to pray. But you see, we also get a glimpse of John the Baptist's ministry because they not only asked Jesus to ask how to pray, but as John also taught his disciples. Jesus placed an importance on prayer. John placed an importance on prayer. Maybe we should too. Okay, enough beating you up for now. For now. But we're about to read is the Lord's Prayer. And again, maybe your heading is labeled the model prayer. I started reciting the Lord's Prayer in our intro with great ease because this is the prayer that most Catholic churches will say every single Sunday. And growing up, I could rattle off the Lord's Prayer in no time flat. There was no problem. It really wasn't a petitioning, though, for my daily bread. It really wasn't asking for forgiveness of my sins. But it was just something that we said together out loud as a church. Again, within itself, it's not that it's a bad thing, but it should never become something that just becomes rote repetition. You know, when we pray, one thing that God says about prayer is just that. It's not supposed to be in vain repetitions. Matthew 6 verse 7 states, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Now, I believe that there's many Catholics who can pray this prayer and know this prayer, have deep convictions in their hearts when they pray it. But it becomes a problem when we're just going through the motions. A couple of points on this. Number one, praying with a vain repetition was the practice of heathens during that time. God set his people, Israel, apart from the heathen nations to be a special people, unlike the heathens. God's people were dedicated to serving him. We should be dedicated to serving him. And as his children, Christians are also set apart from this world. I spoke on this last Sunday, just the fact that we are to be in the world, but not of it. Our citizenship is in heaven. Therefore, we should never act in a way that the heathens do, or our worldly citizens act today. Number two, vain repetitions are not well understood. The vain repetition, in other words, is to talk foolishly or tediously. The Greek word for it is batologio. 
The, uh, uh, Paul the Apostle says in uh, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. In other words, vain repetitions, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. Verse 3, vain repetitions are not heartfelt. Our God desires a relationship with each and every one of us. He wants us to talk to him just as we talk to a friend. We should not babble on and on, nor would we to a friend saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. You know what happens? It would confuse our friends, and it would not further the relationship at all. Instead, we should speak our words with mindful consideration, in meekness, and in fear. 1 Peter 3.15 states, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. In doing so, we are much better to go ahead and clearly express our petitions, our feelings, our thoughts to God. That's what God wants from us. That being said, can we pray this prayer verbatim, word for word, and it still means something? Absolutely. So let's take a deeper look then at what Jesus said when we are to pray. Verse 2. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven. First we see who it is that we're praying to. We're not praying to some far off deity or just some force. Sorry, Star Wars fans. But we are praying to our heavenly Father. This represents a relationship. Let me hear you say, relationship. relationship. Yes, and that is the first of seven points that we're going to look at today. And as it is our heavenly father, this also affirms that we are family. The father being the head of the family. If I were to ask you who God's people were, who was the apple of his eye, what would you say? The Jewish people, right? Yes. God, though, wants that intimate relationship as we now are grafted into this family. Now, notice, God is not their father or the father, but our father. That within itself should offer each and every one of us a huge amount of comfort. But we not only see who we are praying to, but also where? Where is God our Father? In heaven. This again is something that should offer us comfort because we're not putting our trust in something of an earthly realm, but a heavenly one. And that surpasses anything that could be done by man. Instead, it places the faith and trust in the supernatural, in the heavenly. During this time, the heathens used to pray to all kinds of earthly gods. And it seemed as though the gods were always angry at them. Never easy to please or appease. As such, you were required to throw a virgin into a volcano every once in a while. But with our Heavenly Father, we know that nothing is impossible for Him regarding our prayers and our supplications. Now, I mentioned it. There's seven parts to this prayer. Hmm... Seven parts, seven, the number of completion. Coincidence? Continuing verse two, hallowed be your name. This represents worship and praise. Let me hear you say worship and praise. Yes, that's number two. You see, this doesn't mean like happy Halloween, but the word used here in the Greek is hagiazo, and it means to make holy, purify, or consecrate, to venerate, be holy, sanctify. We worship you. Did you know that we worship wrong? Oh, well, what do you mean, Adam? I, I raised my hand for one song. You see, initially, worship used to be at the end of the service, and what happened was people started showing up late, and the pastor got upset that people were missing his, uh, uh, his, his message, so they went ahead and they swapped it around. You see, 
when we worship, it's as if we're saying, thank you, Lord, for giving us your word, for pouring into us, for guiding and directing us. As such, we're going to worship and sing your praises. But people were walking late into the sermon, so they swapped it around. And if they missed a song or two, no big deal, right? No! It is a big deal. Don't get me wrong. In the reverse, the worship time is a time that we use in order to prepare our hearts and minds for his word. Yes and amen? Yes. But, but Adam, I, I've got to get the kids ready. And Jill made this incredible breakfast coffee cake and burrito. You know, i got to eat those before I come in. Look, I totally understand. I have four kids. Been there, done that. Let's just not take our Lord, his worship, or any of the precious time here in his house for granted. See, I told you I was up, done beating up on you just for time. <laughs> worship him. Praise him. He is holy and worthy to be praised. Amen? Amen? Amen. Next, our scripture goes on, and it says, Your kingdom come. This represents expectation in God's promises. Everybody say, Expectation. Yes, we live in a time and day that Christ could come at any minute, at any moment. All the prophecy is fulfilled. Everything is complete. Literally, this service doesn't need to end, and we could be called up into the eastern sky to be with our Lord. Yes and amen? Absolutely. Yes. No more worrying about the mortgage or bills to pay. No more family squabbles. No more worrying about what to eat or what to wear. And Scripture says that we should live expectantly. Matthew 25, 13 states, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. In other words, be ready. Be expectant because God's Word doesn't say if He comes, but that the Son of Man is coming. Our Scripture goes on and says, Your will be done. This represents God's will here on earth. So the request of God's will. Everybody say, request of God's will. Yes, it's number four. All too often when we pray, we can start sounding like kids sitting in the lap of Santa at the mall. I want a bike. I want a football. I want an official Red Rider carbine action 200 shot air range air rifle rifle with a compass in the stock. <laughs> You see, I've heard it said that a lot of times we offer up our prayers as if they're genie prayers. So in other words, God is this big genie up in heaven and he's going to grant us three wishes. Do we, should we talk to God like that? Men, what if you spoke to your wives like that? I want my breakfast made, the house clean when I get home, my laundry done, and oh, don't forget to roll my socks just like I did when I had them in the military. Stand by, because those socks are probably going to be shoved in your mouth. And rightly so. Yet, we can treat our God just like that. As a matter of fact, just in a little bit later in this chapter, we're going to see Jesus tells us to ask, seek, and knock. So it's not wrong to ask God for things in our prayers. But oftentimes when I pray, you will hear me say the caveat, your will be done. See, it's not Adam's will, but God's. The more that we seek him, the more that we are in God's word, the more our wants and needs will then be in tune with his. Now, if you ask God for something evil or sinful or outside of his will, is he going to give it to you? Okay, okay. So, how about this? Dear God, I pray that you would turn each and every car in the parking lot into a Mercedes-Benz S-Class Series. <laughs> Was that good? Everybody want a Mercedes? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. You see, we're not going to go out into the park. I'm sorry, folks. We're not going to go out into the parking lot and find our cars all turned into Mercedes. Could he? Absolutely. But only if it's his will. So this begs the question. How do we find out what is the will of God? And specifically in our lives. Prayer and come out tonight for the fireside chat and you can find out 
what God's will is in your life as we take that deeper dive into prayer. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day by day our daily bread. This represents requirements, uh, excuse me, request of daily requirements. Everybody say request of daily requirements. That's number five. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 16. We're going to look at uh, verses 4 and 5. And in verse 4, it states, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Ah, but what happens if they try to gather too much or leave leftovers for that day's quota? Go down to verse 17. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered, some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered according to each one's need. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. But some of them left part until the morning, and it bred worms and stank. Now, was God just being a big meanie here? Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> Late till the next morning, there's going to be worms. Ah, oh, it's going to be so nasty. No. He was teaching them to depend on him daily. Why does that sound familiar? Oh, yeah. Verse 3. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, this isn't just sustenance in the way only dealing with food, but in everything. We should come to rely on God each and every day, coming to him, praying, giving thanks, and asking for his divine intervention into our lives. Once a week? Every other day? Daily. Verse 4. And forgive us our sins. This is a still a daily request for forgiveness. Everybody say, forgiveness. forgiveness. That's number six. You were wondering, why did Adam break out this whiteboard? Tell me some sins. Any sins, just call them out. Pride. Ooh, there we go. Did I hear? Oh, oh. See those quick hands? I still got it. <laughs> Said lying also. What else? Stealing. Uh, I'm sorry. Stealing. There we go. Right? A-L-E-E. -E. Yeah. <laughs> Hate. Ooh. What else? Did somebody just say speeding? Really? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Murder, murder, yes. Sorrow. Sorrow. That can definitely be a sin. Let's all close our eyes and pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, we need your forgiveness each and every day. We need to come before you. We need to exercise your grace and your mercy because we can't do it on our own. It's only because of you and what you did on the cross for each and every one of us. So, Lord, please forgive us this day. Amen. Think on that for a minute. Let that sink in. Lamentations 3, 22, 23 says, His mercies are new every morning. Through the Lord's mercies, 
are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And when we ask for forgiveness of our sins, we are given a clean slate. We're as white as snow. Isaiah 118 states, Though your sins are like scarlet, they are as white as snow. They are like red crimson. They shall be as wool. What does it take to be forgiven? Simply ask, and you shall receive. Ask Jesus to take away all of the sins, and he's good to do so, because that's what held him to the cross. It wasn't the nails in his hands and in his feet. It was your sins and mine. When you're in sin, you can feel the heaviness of it. I know I can. But after you confess your sin, how much better do you feel? In third grade, I cheated on my history exam. In fourth grade, I stole my Uncle Max's toupee and glued it on my face when I was Moses in the Hebrew school play. In fifth grade, I went ahead and I knocked down my, my sister Edie down the stairs and I blamed it on the dog. When I, my mom sent me to summer camp for fat kids, they went ahead and they served lunch and I had nuts and I pigged out and I ate everything and they kicked me out. But the worst thing I ever did, I mixed a pot of fake puke at home and then I went to the movie theater and I hid the puke under my jacket. I climbed up into the balcony and then I made this noise like and then I dumped it over the side all over the people in the audience and then this was horrible all the people started getting sick and throwing up all over each other I never felt so bad in my life now going back to my Catholic days you see we used to have this thing called confession and you'd go into this confessional, this little booth, and you pull back the curtain, and there would be a priest sitting there. And you'd go ahead, and you'd tell him all of your sins, just like I did. And he'd tell you, that, go ahead and say a few Hail Marys as a penance, and then you were out. And you were good to sin until the next time you went to confession. But you see, there's the problem with religion. Yes, Scripture says that we should confess our sins to one another. Look at James 5, verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. But does it say that we need an intermediary, a priest to bring those sins up to God in order to be forgiven? Jesus simply tells us here in this passage, forgive us our sins. Then the next line in Scripture says, For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Oh, I don't know about that one, Adam. I mean, yes, I want my sins forgiven, but you don't know what that person did to me. See, we're seeing a double standard in our justice system. We're seeing a double standard in our government. Do we really want that to bleed into our personal relationship with God? I'm so thankful that his mercies are new, that there's grace in regards to my sin. Now, I know all of you have achieved a higher spiritual plane, and you don't have to worry as much. But for me, I need that mercy and grace each and every day, daily. So then if our Heavenly Father is good to forgive, he's also good to forget, too. That's right. He forgives us as far as the east is from the west. In Psalm 103, 12, it states, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Aren't you glad he didn't say from the north to the south? That wouldn't have been very far, right? And plus, once you get all the way down to the South Pole, what's going to happen? Oh, that's it. But what about east to the west? You start traveling east. When does it become traveling west? And vice versa. I said that our God is good to forgive and forget. That's right. God forgets too. Hebrews 8.12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. When Jesus says to forgive those who are indebted to us, I hope that we all just think back on what was given to us, and then we drop the double standard for the rest of the world. Amen? Amen. 
And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We can all too often be that way, right? Yes. But he delivers us from evil. Everybody say, deliver us from evil. That's number seven. But even when the evil one comes, yes, Satan is going to come. It says he roams this earth like a roaring lion. He and his minions. Pun intended. God is good to give us a way out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 states, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, I think too many people take this verse out of context. They don't fully understand what it's saying here. And you hear people often say, God is never going to give you more than you can handle. You see, that's not what the verse is really saying. You see, the verse emphasizes that God will not place us in a situation where temptation to do the wrong thing is irresistible, but will always give us a way of escape. This verse puts the responsibility for our own sinful choices on ourselves and reminds us that none of us are locked into making a sinful decision. The context of this verse is of the temptation to sin. Not the trials, not the tribulations, not the sufferings. Secondly, it has two of the words in the Bible that I love most. But God. It's not that we can't overcome the trials and tribulations, but we should never try to do it on our own without God. Adam, I'll never be able to forgive them. But God can change your heart. Adam, I'm in the pits of despair and there's no way out. But God can lead you to that place of joy again. The addiction is too powerful, I'll never break it. But God. He created the universe. Psalm 33, verse 6 states, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them, by the breath of his mouth. Our God is a star breather. In just six days, he created the heavens and the earth, the fish of the sea, all the animals, both large and small. And then in his image, he created man, the pinnacle of his creation. He created you. As we wrap up today, all too often, I believe that we try to put God into a box. We try to apply the restraints of this world to him. He's outside of time and space. He is awesome and all-powerful, omnipresent, omnipotent God. Our problems aren't too big for God. Our sins are aren't you great for God? Yes, we can be a bunch of great sinners, but our God is bigger. And thank God for that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do come before you as sinners, as those, as Romans 3.23 says, who fall short of your glory. And God, as such, I just pray that you would offer forgiveness to each and every one of us, that you would wipe our sins white as snow. Give us that clean slate once again so that when we go out, we can truly represent and model you, Lord. We pray that you would increase and we would decrease. So precious Heavenly Father, we bring these prayers before you now. We lay them at your feet. No how much we love you. We thank you and sing your praises. And it is in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. If everyone would please stand for the last song.
Ladies and gentlemen, your calls to action today, there's only one. As we looked at the Lord's Prayer, we were given a model. Yes, we can say it verbatim, and that would not be wrong. We looked at the seven attributes within this prayer. And again, this is your call to action. Go home. Read it one more time. Meditate on it. We have a God who is good. A God who is our provider daily. Be reminded that he is good to forgive us. Even when we've done nothing to deserve it. And lastly, know that there is nothing too big, too hard, too difficult for you to handle with our God. If you start to forget, and if you remember nothing else about this sermon, just remember two little words. But God. And pray. May God bless you and keep you. If there's anybody who needs prayer, I'll be down front.